Oh, it's a very different style paddling than today. Today's style is not really, uh, doesn't really hardly exist as far as I'm concerned. These guys today, you know, they're in these spud boats with no, no real lines to them, no points, no, no water line, no length. They just sort of go down a river and blob their way down. Well, I think that back in the old days there was a lot of style involved to it. Style and speed. Technique. And technique. There was a lot of technique in, in those days of trying to do things like just a simple thing that people don't really think much about nowadays, just keeping the bow up. The new boats are so big and bulbous in the front that the bows naturally ride on the surface. But in a lot of the older, longer, small boats, that bow was constantly going underwater through waves, holes, and drops. And part of the art was being able to move that bow around and get it where you wanted to be and keep it up on the surface. A little bit of that, I think, has been lost in the new style of boating. The old style, we certainly had to perfect a lot of those techniques and make them work well. So. We started in 81 with precision rafting. And I think we got our first self-bailing raft in somewhere around 1986. So there was a good four or five years in there where it was all, you know, five gallon buckets and pulling over to shore and dumping the whole raft out. And a lot of trips at high water where you'd start into Charlie's Choice and that boat would get full. And the next thing you know, you're bouncing and ricocheting all the way down and the, your next stop is uh, the big hole at the bottom of National Falls with a boat full of water and hitting it where you just submarine through. And that would be your final, finally you could get to a spot where you get the boat over to the side and get the water out of it. It was, it was white knuckle action. Self-bailing was a true godsend to the, to the sport of high-end rafting, top-end rafting like the upper yacht or any kind of continuous white water, the big sandy and later on the ruffle fork and golly. golly. Well, certainly that was part of it. Part of it, you know, you don't think much about it because now you raft down the river. Not only do you not have to deal with the boat sloshing around full of water, but the bailing bucket itself was a hazard because it was essentially an old paint bucket or drywall bucket. It was hard plastic and a pretty good size. And you had to have that thing where it was convenient to get to to be able to bail out quickly if necessary. And of course, when you slam down and bang your shin against it, or oh, yeah. it flings was, up and hits somebody, that was fun. It kind of always laid some good action on people, so you kind of had to be careful for that. And then, of course, like you said, sometimes it was a decision: well, should we just put the effort and bail all this water out, or should we all just jump out and dump it out like we did the old kayak that had a leak in it? And, so you're always trying to compromise that difference and still stay with the group and the flow. and That kind of added a whole nother element to the game of whitewater rafting that sort of doesn't exist so much nowadays. Well, Ed Sliger was uh, an old man when we met him. He was already old and I, I would guess in his mid-70s when we met him back in about 1980. 1981 and uh, he was he was quite friendly and he was just he, he'd see us and he had a sparkle in his eyes when he'd see us and he'd come over and tell us stories and have a beer with us and he, he was a, a fun guy he had a lot of a lot of old Friendsville stories and a lot of old stories about the river itself so he was always interested in hanging out with old Ed and uh, he lived in a little outbuilding behind what was Ken's Tavern back then, back in what would be the parking lot now. And he got taken advantage of by a lot of the local people. Uh, they, they, they sometimes took some of his few possessions, which were basically old, antique kind of collectible stuff. So we always felt sort of sorry for Ed because he got picked on. But he, he was a great guy. We loved Ed. One time, uh, Jeff Snyder ran the the rock slides over on Muddy Creek in West Virginia by the Iron Furnace, and 
flipped over and almost ripped his thumb off. So he had this big open wound on his thumb. And the next day he was in Friendsville. We are getting ready to paddle the upper yacht again. He was showing that wound to Ed Slager. Ed Slager said, here, let me let me help you heal that up. So he, he took Ed's, or Jeff's hand and spit a big, spit a chewing tobacco wad in, in, in Jeff's wound and brought Jeff to tears from the pain. That was funny. Yes. My recollection, he was, you know, he was, he was just, just had a certain personality in in on Ed. And it was one of those sort of easygoing personalities. He was the kind of person that just was kind of a jovial person, but at the same time he almost had this appearance of a hobo type of person. You know, he'd wear these old brown khaki pants and an old sort of tweed dress jacket. And that was the sort of style with a little crusher hat. And just had a, a jovial smile and always Always happy to just come in and sit down and have a beer and tell you a little story about when he lived up in Kendall as a boy and would ride the train down into Friendsville. And he could he could do the hand jive thing where he could slap his hands and sing a song. He used to always come in. We'd be drinking a beer, maybe having a fishtail sandwich, and he'd sing his one of his favorite songs. I remember was riding on that old New River train. He would just hand jive it off his legs and hands and slapping and making the beat and singing the song and just kind of brought you almost like an old timer joy, you know, how, how life was and friends were long before we ever came here. What happened though, Dad? Ed finally got to the point one winter when we weren't there where he couldn't take care of himself anymore and shipped off to uh, an old folks home downstate. I never saw him again after that. Do you guys uh, have any recollections of Pappy Ross? Have any uh, interaction with... Well, you know, we didn't uh, have as much interaction with Pappy Ross as our nemeses at uh, Upper Yawk Expeditions did, but uh, he was a good man uh, in the mold of uh, uh, Woody Guthrie or something like that. He, he is a very uh, libertarian kind of guy and uh, he, he liked boaters. He wrote a poem one time about the indestructible bouncing rubber raft and and at the time when everybody else was against us coming into town and running the river, he was all for it. Uh, he's a ge generous man with a warm heart. Had a bunch of sons who were also very cool guys, hung around with us, and like I say, more with the guys from Upper Yacht Expeditions, and then us and precision rafting, but Pappy Ross was a good man. Well, the guys from Upper Yak Expeditions uh, definitely deserve mention, mainly because they're not here anymore. So many of them are gone. Uh, the only folks that were with Upper Yak Expeditions that are they're still alive, it's sort of like a rock band where the original members are gone and this, uh, some other members took over their spots and are still around. But Dave Martin, of course, is a, a legendary wild man that's, that's still around. And uh, to a lesser extent, uh, they're not really around anymore, but they still are alive. Is uh, Terry Collins and Mary Brockman that are now married, have been married for 20 years. They both guided and were part owners of Upper Yacht Expeditions at one time. And uh, Buford Davis, of course, that was uh, probably the, the leader of Upper Yacht Expeditions in its probably its more profitable era. But the original founders were people like uh, Rick Sturgill and Chuck Tangway and Dion Carroll that are that are no longer with us. Rick Sturgill perished in a landslide gold uh, gold panning in Alaska, and Dion Carroll was our first one to go. He was killed in a horrible car wreck uh, somewhere down south, and Chuck Tangway, who was a steeplejack, had, had a sustained some horrible injuries falling off of a church steeple and 
ended up taking his own life about 10 years ago. But uh, they were every bit as out there as, as we were the, in the formation days of precision rafting. They were out there on the upper yacht. They all had a background. Basically, they were they were from uh, Mountain River Tours down on the New in the Gauley. That was their their point of origin, whereas our point of origin was more the river companies up in Ohio pile and on the cheap. Some of the rapid names. Got any stories about those, or how rapids might you might be connected to with their names, or you were there, or, or I mean, I know there's been. I mean, a, look at this Charlie's Choice, which the whole rapids named after Charlie Walbridge because he decided he he was walking out at that point. That was back in the early 70s, and then the, the rapid is one of these rapids that's got an incredible number of rocks named after people. There's uh, not one, not two, but three rocks named after Bill Heller. That's the Heller series. Moving slightly downstream from there, you got Martin Rock, which has probably pinned more rafts than almost any rock anywhere on any river. Uh, just to the left of that is Whittemore Rock that, uh, that'll flip you as sure as can be if you slide through there and catch, a, catch an edge on Whittemore Rock. Uh, right in between Whittemore and Martin is the drop that leads into the bird bath, named after Kevin here, which will surf the heck out of you. 30 feet further river left than that is Tangway Rock, named after Chuck Tangway, which will flip you if you look at it sideways. A lot of, a lot of rocks in that rapid, named after people. Like who you went with and... My first run was when I was 17, and it was in 1974. And I ran with uh, Fish Siler, Bob Siler, Jerry Leckwick, who of course was lucky, and uh, Jerry Michaelick. Basically, I was invited to go along because I was the only one that had a car. And uh, we ran the shuttle with my uh, parents' station wagon and, and Fish's uh, little motorcycle. That's how we ran a shuttle. And I was the only one that didn't flip over that day uh, out of the four of us. There were a lot of flips and swims with the other guys who were all older than me. They were all three to four to five years older than me. But uh, it was it was everything I'd I'd hoped it would be after hearing all the stories for a couple of years and very very exciting and uh, I went on and on and on to run it more and more and more until within a couple of years I'd run it more than anybody else and then that's when uh, most of my friends you know, began the sort of the new wave of, of kayaking at the time and. Uh, runs like the Upper Yacht, the Lower Big Sandy, rivers at, at high water and flood stage all became popular around here. Or I sometimes hear stories of, of people saying that they went down in inner tubes and stuff. Do you buy into that, 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 that they've inner tubed all the way down from Gap Falls? Oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it that that mm -hmm. happened. Uh, Back when we first started kayaking it, I mean, it wasn't too unusual to come around a bend on the river and see the the torn wreckage of a Grumman canoe plastered on some rocks or to find an oar, not a paddle, but like an oar from a rowboat washed up in some driftwood pile somewhere. And and lots of locals ventured upstream on, by, on foot from Friendsville and went further and further up into the rapids with inner tubes and inner tube down through them. We, we came across them and saw them numerous times. That definitely did happen. Uh, the the thing about the Upper Yak is if you're standing at the put-in and saying run, it looks like easy, like this. If you're standing at the bridge in Friendsville, you look upstream, it looks easy like this. What you can't see from any of the vantage points is the, the class four and five rapids that are in between. So as Jeff Snyder used to say, it's grum and bait. People get tricked into thinking that they could do it in a canoe. Well, Keith Backlund made New World Paddles, which were undeniably the, the best wooden paddle that you could buy anywhere in the world. And uh, he had made his paddles in several different places and ended up in Friendsville in the early 80s and set up shop there and was a almost a, a focal point of where people went when they weren't on the river. Uh, he was a great guy, a great storyteller, and a jovial person in general, and uh, everybody loved hanging out with Keith, and he had a real 
wit and a real sense of humor about him. Told some great stories. He always had a great story. And he would just be working away on his paddles whenever you were over there. And I, I apprenticed with him, as did several other people. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing uh, part of my life, uh, learning the art of, of paddling and, and where his concepts had come from as far as his actual experience of, of being a kayaker himself and, and how that applied to every, every phase of making a, a kayak paddle. I, I paddled exclusively and still do with, back, with Backland paddles and New World paddles, as does Rogers Bell, as does Kevin here, and many, many others uh, that were the, you know, the expert paddlers from this area. Sorely missed. Sometimes I <coughs> think about Keith and I, you know, he was like a brother to me in so many ways, an older brother who kind of showed us some rivers and showed us some ideas and had a good spirit about things. But sometimes I think, you know, when he came to Friendsville, he sort of made a certain connection with a lot of the local people. Being a guy from a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania and stuff, I think he could really relate to the local people in a way that maybe I couldn't necessarily do quite as easily because I came from, you know, suburban Washington, D.C. area in Virginia. And I think his being in town really did a lot to kind of pacify the local boater connection a little bit. Because, you know, he would be in the bar and he'd go in and have a shot of whiskey and talk with the local people and the bartenders and the bar owners and the various people around town as he built paddles. And, tell them stories of things in his world outside of the world of Friendsville, which they found interesting. So I think in Friendsville, Keith was actually an important figure that helped blend the merge of boaters into the world of Friendsville. 